Hello, planet Earth. Welcome to Casterly Rock. I'm Preston L. Young, and we are at my YouTube channel, IDK, my BFF Jill 730. And today we're going to take a break from the Buffington Post, and we're going to take a break from all the goddamn Spider-Man news, because I know you're sick of hearing about it. I'm sick of hearing about it. I fell asleep during Guardians of the Galaxy. It was like watching somebody play a video game. Hey, Wesley, tell people how much I enjoy watching other people play video games, right? Guardians of the Galaxy was lame. I'm not on the Marvel bandwagon. What, you're just gonna pimp out Spider-Man now too? Thanks. So, let's go over to Westeros and talk about what the heck is going on over there. I've got a theory. So, basically, over in Game of Thrones, or The Song of Ice and Fire, I don't know what you're a part of, but if you're watching this video, you need to have read A Song of Ice and Fire, all the books, up to A Dance with Dragons, because I'm about to lay it on you. So I have a theory about the Seven, and why the Seven are the most important religion in Westeros. So, what is it, why does it matter, and what's my theory? So, basically, the Seven is the religion of archetypes, because the Andals brought over this religion that actually was, you know, their whole religion back in Andalos. And they brought it over to Westeros, whatever. Apparently, in Andalos, this Seven situation was like their kind of creation of their whole society and it basically just persevered through the ages and so whatever now most of the people in westeros now like subscribe to this religion what is it okay so like i said you've got seven archetypes there are the father the mother the maid the smith the warrior the crone and the stranger you feel me okay so what are they what do they mean eh, well So, the seven gods are all part of one god, okay? And it's like, they're just the seven different aspects of the one god. And that's what makes them archetypes. So, you've got the father who represents judgment and, you know, authority. And then you've got the mother who represents, like, forgiveness and understanding and, and mercy, etc. So, then you've also got the warrior who represents pretty much just that war and you know honor and steadfastness and whatever so then you've got the smith who represents kind of all of creation any kind of like creative element you go to the smith for right and so then you've also got the maid who represents like chastity and virginity and purity and then you've got the crone who represents wisdom and you know like uh, leadership and guidance and then you finally got the stranger who is basically got no face and it's death right so what's the deal why does this work for them well okay so you've got seven kingdoms right Aegon the Conqueror came in he united all of the kingdoms put them under one roof and boom now we've got Westeros as we understand it okay so, the religion of the Seven works for Westeros because it is about these seven different aspects being one great big idea that's bigger than the sum of its parts, okay? And so, what you've got here is the seven aspects of one god, you've got seven kingdoms of one Westeros, and now we've got this really interesting, crazy, like, 
three or four wars going on, okay? So my whole idea is that the Seven as a religion works for Westeros because it's about people working together toward a common something, okay? And so my thought is that by the end of the seventh book of Song of Ice and Fire, we will actually, once the dust settles, we will have what we will kind of refer to as the New Seven. Why do I think this? Because I feel like they're pretty much throwing it in our faces. Okay, so who are they? Well, the father, I gotta say, the jury's still out. Your obvious nod would be Ned, but I think that the seven that we end up with will be living at the end, right? So, gotta say, Ned's not in it. It could be Jamie. There's always the case for Jamie because he's a father, but I don't know if any of his children will make it through because, you know, Maggie the Frog told Cersei all of her kids were gonna fucking die. I don't know. So, father, I don't know. But mother is the easiest one. It's Daenerys. They call her the mother of dragons. They call her Misa, which means mother. Hello, she's your mother, okay? So, there's the father. Don't know. There's da Daenerys as your mother. Now, the smith. Obviously, Gendry is a smith. But if you look at Tyrion and the way he, like, built the chain, and he's always, like, very creative and making, you know, ideas and all kind of progress in certain situations, Tyrion would also be an argument for, you know, the smith. So you got Gendry and the smith, Gendry and Tyrion as the smith. I think they're your top contenders, really. But again, on them, the jury's still out. Now, you've got the warrior. I think, obviously, the warrior could be John, but, you know, they could throw us one and end up having Jamie or even Sam. I think that would be really neat. But, obviously, John's pretty much your warrior, right? And so, there's father, who knows, <laughs> mother, Daenerys, the smith, Gendry, maybe Tyrion, and then you've got John for your warrior, probably. So, who do we have left? We've got the maid, which is so obviously Sansa. She's a virgin, etc., etc. Although, we could have Brienne, because they call her the Maid of Tarth. And also, on the warrior, Brienne is also, like, a contender for the name. Like, she could definitely be the warrior. Who knows? I don't want to be sexist. So, you've got father, who knows? Mother, Daenerys. You've got... Gendry, Tyrion, Smith, you've got John, Brienne, question mark, for Warrior, you've got Sansa, and or, you know, Brienne, for the maid, and then you've got the crone, who is so obviously Catelyn motherfucking Tully, my favorite, I love Catelyn, I love Catelyn, she thinks about religion all the time, like I do, you go Catelyn, I love her, and now she's all Lady Stoneheart, and can't talk, things like this. Oh, yeah. Go Catelyn. <laughs> and then, okay. Blah, blah, blah. Catelyn's your crone. And then the stranger is so obviously Arya. Okay, so the stranger... Okay, there's a many-faced god that, you know, Arya is over in Bravo, like, dealing with and things like this, right? And so, like, she is this many-faced god. She has no face. She's a stranger. Like, every time she pops up, she goes by a different name. She changes her looks. She's just not anybody that you know. And so by the time that she comes back into Westeros, she will literally be a stranger. She will quite possibly be wearing another face. Or even, like, no face. How weird and crazy would that be? So that's my thought. What do you guys think? Do you think I'm crazy? No, you don't. You're like, oh, Presnell Young, you're so smart. You're just, like, ruling it up there, Casterly Rock. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'm going to be working on a Wolfram and Hart slash The Senior Partners uh, Buffy vs. Discussion for you guys. And comment back. Let me know what you think about my theory about there being a new Seven by the time all is said and done. Because the thing about it is we're all so worried about Rachlor and, you know, the many-faced god, the drowned god, all of these, like, super potent gods. And we just kind of dismiss the Seven because they're new. But... The Seven are important because they are about actual people actually doing things that are actually going on. So I think the Seven are important. I think all these other gods don't matter. It's about people. People and their decisions matter. So comment, like, share, subscribe, and as always, question. And I hope you're having a great 2015 so far. We'll see you next time.